catching up. Well, think, oh, we we're do? gonna catch up a little bit today. Oh, fuck you. Hey, welcome to another installment of Catching Up. I'm Sam. I'm Chris. I'm Jake. This week, Adam Freeman and Mark Bernardin come back on the show. Yes. Woo. Yeah, man. They're here to talk about Genius Cartel, the second volume of their Genius series with uh, Image Comics through and, and Top Cow. The uh, That volume comes out in comic book stores everywhere and on Comixology on Wednesday, February 21st. Let's let them talk about it. And coming back on the show, we've got Adam Freeman and Mark Bernardin. The uh, second volume of their uh, of their series, Genius, uh, titled Genius Cartel, comes out in comic book stores everywhere and on Comixology on Wednesday, February 21st, collecting the five issues of the of the Cartel miniseries. Guys, thanks again for coming on the show. No problem. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So here we are, end of the second arc. Um, escalation, I mean, the first arc is all, you know, just like Rage Against the Machine once said, it's the Battle of Los Angeles. This one takes it global very james bond and you know shades of sicario and scarface at the same time was the intent always when you were kind of chronicling the adventures of destiny just to kind of i I think the mission statement of this uh of this arc i think is in the second issue when one of the characters says sometimes you just got to blow shit up was that always kind of the mission statement with the second arc (laughs) i mean it's always my mission statement i i love blowing shit up that's what i'm good at (laughs) don't tell the fbi of course (laughs) especially not these days yeah, seriously. Um, um, yeah, I think, I think we always, you know, look. That's what Destiny does best, right? Is she wages war, so you know she's going to wage war. I think what what Mark and I wanted to make sure was why does she wage war, and does she wage war because she's just violent in nature, or because she has a cause? And what would happen to Destiny after she accomplished everything she wanted to do in Los Angeles? Um, you know, that's the the intellectual aspect to it. The the flip side of it is, like Mark said, we like to blow shit up. If you look at, any, you know, almost any of our stuff from all the way back to, to uh, Monster Attack Network or Highwaymen, like we just we like big, exploding, loud, fun stories. So our mission was to blow shit up, even though Destiny probably had some other uh, motives. <laughs> yeah, and there's also a desire, you know, when you when you're continuing the story of a character, is to try and, and place that character in a situation that she's totally unfamiliar with. It's challenging your character in ways she hasn't been challenged before. And so part of the you know, our mission statement for this one was uh if Siege was about her being surrounded by sort of friends and, and loved ones in a neighborhood, in a terrain that she knows intimately well then it felt like the best way to to take her out of her comfort zone was to throw her in a completely alien environment and to isolate her from people that she has connections with and then see what she does and then see what happens to her and then see if she bends or if she breaks. Was it kind of tricky and and surprising as storytellers to come up with scenarios, you know, without going, without giving the game away, there's one sequence where she's, you know, trapped in a tunnel and she's not, you know, she's got people that she's trying to escort or take care of or you know, just putting finding putting her in these in these scenarios for a character that that tends to have you know most of the angles worked out. How, was it kind of challenging to to challenge the character as well? I mean, it feels as if you know setting out to write a book about the greatest military mind of her generations, while neither of us being the greatest military minds of our generation. You know, we were always challenged by this book and always challenged by this character, but. You know, it's like if you're writing a mystery, you start with who committed the murder and then you figure out complications to that plan. You know, we we have the benefit of not having to think on our feet. We have the benefit of getting to sit down and figure out, you know, what the story is and how it's going to go. But getting complications for her and finding new places to put her in and new new problems to to place in front of her. You know, I'm not going to say it's not the hard part, but but that's the kind of stuff, especially the action stuff we could do all day. I think, too, if you look at Destiny or you look at the storytelling and the point of view in Siege, the reader is a little bit more on the side of the cops in that they are in the dark. And you 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 know, Destiny is facing challenges because it's a, you know, an undertaking like that is massive. But a lot of it is is what does she have up her sleeve? You know, there weren't a lot of 
of how is she going to get out of this one? It's more like, what is she doing? And every time they think they know, it turns out her plan is something else. In Cartel, you are much more in the driver's seat with Destiny um, as she's making those plans and as she's getting out of those pinches. So that was a little point of view shift, I think, that you'll see between the two. You were mentioning Destiny as a character, and I think the last time you guys uh, were on, you kind of compared her to, to Rambo, this guy that can never know peace because he found the one thing he was good at, and that was, again, blowing shit up, be it, you know... Soviet gunships, or uh, who, who's he fighting in the fourth one, Jake? Uh, it's the the uh, who the fuck? <laughs> they <have> aliens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, aliens and yeah, um, aliens and Cambodians is who he's fighting. Yeah, exactly. In the fourth. Yeah, that's what it was. The, uh, yeah, I think I think Destiny is Rambo in First Blood. Taking on the taking on Sheriff Teague and all all those guys. Yeah. And yeah, but, yeah, you know, and I think that that. You know, as as much as I do love the character of John Rambo, and as much as there are, you know, definitely connection points between the two, um, Destiny's story I think will lead us in ways that that Rambo never did. When Destiny's never going to be riding horseback in Afghanistan. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Yeah, char- charging a uh, charging a tank or charging a helicopter of some kind. Yeah. Wait, so wait. I, I got to cross that off the list. No <laughs> horseback. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Crap! Never say never, Mark. <laughs> yeah. The um, but is Destiny to kind of continue that analogy? Is she a character that can never truly know, or at least be comfortable in peacetime? I mean, part of me wants to figure that out. Part of me wants to investigate that a little bit. You know, if we get to Volume Five, you know, we'll see actually what Destiny at peace gets to look like, and of course, the one last job that she gets to be pulled back in to do. Um, but I think that she is still in, she has so much inner turmoil as opposed to, to outer turmoil. I think that, that peace for her is the, 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 what's the old saying? Uh, a man's reach should exceed his grasp or what's a heaven for, you know, the, it'll always be the thing that's just outside of her grasp. I think she's, she's still trying to figure out who she is and is she, uh, you know, a, a person fighting to protect those that can't protect themselves or is she you know a little bit of a not psychopath is the wrong word but is she is she creating the chaos in order to solve it to kind of piggyback off that point what would you say you know destiny obviously her macro story is her destiny she lives up to her name and how she how she fits in los angeles how she fits within the military industrial complex at least at the start of of cartel and how she fits on an international scale what would you say her big arc is over the course of of cartel at least how she grows as a character as a person you know i mean it's it's funny like i you know, I think Adam and I had talked about this a long time ago about the the requirement for a character to have an arc, and some of the some of the f- best characters in fiction, some of our favorite characters, don't actually have arcs. Sherlock Holmes does not have an arc. James Bond doesn't have an arc. Indiana Jones doesn't have an arc. You know, I, I, they don't they don't learn anything. Like Danny Ocean doesn't learn anything new about himself by the time he gets to Ocean's Eleven or Ocean's Thirteen, for that matter. Um. So I don't think that Destiny has an overwhelmingly transformative arc in that she's not a different person at the end of the story than she was at the beginning. I think that she has a, a, an awakening arc in that she realizes sort of the depths of herself in a way. She realizes what she's capable of. She realizes what she's willing to endure. But, you know, the Destiny going in is the Destiny coming out, who's a little bit... Um, chastened by herself and the events she's a little bit more aware of pain and her tolerances for it um but she is not like oh man i really wanted to take up knitting i'm gonna be a knitter because i've realized that i'm better at this than that that's not for her and i i would agree with that with um the siege arc and with the cartel arc but with some of the plans that mark and i have for the third arc, I think you are. I think you will see a slightly more fallible, slightly more human destiny with what we have set up for her to face. I think it was. Uh, 
I think it's 2000 AD. Or was it Wagner that once described like Judge Dredd as progressing at the speed of a glacier? Right. <laughs> yeah. And then I remember talking to Greg Rucka once and he was like, I think right after he took the Punisher gig over at Marvel and he's like, why the fuck does every Punisher movie give him an arc? Why does he have to have like that, <laughs> that like the surrogate family? And... The, yeah. Or the story that we all learn. What did we learn today, kids? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like there's something really captivating, at least to me, about a character who operates more like a weather system than a character. Like the Joker is just a storm. I don't need to know where the storm came from. I don't need to know why the storm is crashing. I just want to see the storm and I just want to see the chaos. And there are some characters that, that that's where they're magnetic. That's where they're fascinating is watching their effects on other people, including themselves. Would you say, you know, uh, you've got Reginald Gray coming in from, from the uh, siege arc uh, halfway through through cartels, kind of like, would you say he's kind of a POV character for the audience, kind of like, oh, or at least a character that we, whose head we can get into a little more than Destiny? It's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I think that, like Adam said, that the perspective shifts a bit in, in cartel and that we are riding shotgun with Destiny more than we'd ever been before, you know, and I think that, that because Destiny is thrown to the wolves and thrown for loops and destiny, especially in the first issue of, of cartel destiny is doing that thing that everybody's done at some point, which is go to a new job or a new school and not know anybody and not know their place. You know, I think that, that in this story, destiny is a, is a slightly more sympathetic character, a, because we've lived with her for a while, but B because she is for the first time doing a recognizably human thing, <laughs> which is not, you know, waging war on the cops, but it's just trying to fit in and trying to find her place. Um, and I think that once she kicks into gear, then yeah, Reggie comes in and Sela comes in and, and we can start to, you know, see destiny from other POVs. But I, I do like the fact that we, we get to ride with her and we get to experience, you know, sort of human emotion with her in a way we didn't in the first one. And Reggie, from a storytelling perspective, he's one of the, so far, he's been the only person that could remotely get in her head. So from as storytellers, it, it helps give some of her motivation without the lead character itself doing these big, what Mark and I call info dumps, you know, which is just like, now I'm going to tell you exactly why I'm doing this and what my motivation is. So he really, he kind of helps us from a story aspect too. One of the things I dig about the the book is you guys really do kind of treat the the old uh, axiom every issue can be somebody's first cuz in one page you very succinctly like like here's the story so far like without it feeling like forced like there's a very uh, you guys go about it very organically so I I really I really do dig that in like liter- in every single issue in the in this uh in the in the cartel arc yeah, I mean, it's we, we grew up on, on TV in the 80s and every episode previously on Knight Rider and then you would see everything you needed to know for that episode of Knight Rider. And that kind of like orientating a reader in an experience and giving them the information they need, um, I think that's sometimes that kind of service pays off. With the, uh... And I think when you, have a, when you have such a high concept idea, you need to kind of you know, allow the view, the reader to kind of run alongside the train and hop on as opposed to just letting them get hit with it and not always understanding what the premise is. And this is a pretty far out there character. Um, so, yeah, we just want to make sure when you open every issue, you're, you're armed with what you need to enjoy that issue. Uh, well, if I remember correctly, uh, your first issue was a... For you, Adam, was an easy reader Spider-Man if, yes. <laughs> with Morgan Freeman. And if I remember for you, Mark, it was a maybe not completely vetted issue of Savage Sword of Conan? Yes. <laughs> what was it? <laughs> uh, you know, you guys, lifelong friends, lifelong geeks, how does it feel to, to, to make good? You know, you've got, you've got two, two arcs now under your belt with just with Destiny alone in addition to what, you, what else you guys do in the entertainment industry. How is that kind of... Are there ever moments where you guys kind of like look at each other and we're like, we're living the fucking dream. (laughs) 
we get to do cool stuff. I mean, you know, in 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 both our you know our real life and our comic book life, I, I we say it all the time. Like we truly really try not to complain. You know, when Mark and I were were coming up and we first started to do comics, we were part of this big circle of friends from high school, and you know, one was in law school, one was was you know, working nights, right, Mark, doing like pie graphs for a, for a, Mm -hmm. for a, for a financial company. And they'd bitch about their job and we'd bitch about ours and they would look at us and they'd go, shut the fuck up. (laughs) You know, like at the time, Mark was at EW getting to go to every premiere writing, meeting every famous person. I was at, at MTV producing all these concerts and daily live shows with all the celebrities. And they were like, Try sitting behind a desk in a bank for eight hours and then come talk to us. So that's a perspective that I really try to keep. You know, we work stressful jobs. Yeah, but everybody works stressful jobs. And and I, you know, I drive along the the 405 and I see guys digging ditches on the side of the road. I'm like, that's a hard job. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, we, we lucked out. Yeah. I mean, there's... The, of course, once it, it's all relative to a certain degree that once you're in the middle of it, you have no perspective on the outside of it. Right. But that is what the rest of the world is for. That is what your other friends are for. That's what your family's for. To remind you that, like, yeah, I understand. It's three o'clock in the morning, and you're outside in the hills of Massachusetts as they're shooting an episode of television that you wrote, and you're cold. But they're shooting an episode of television that you wrote, and you're on the set of it. And I get you're cold, but you're living every kind of fucking dream at once. And, you know, getting to write comics is a thing we've wanted to do since we were 9, 10, 11 years old. And, and you know, even just every time we see, hey, there's a cover for issue number four that came in, that's awesome. Hey, there's a couple reviews. It's great that people are reading it. Like, this is, this is in every way, you know, manifesting of dreams coming true. You know, you had mentioned writing for television. I think the, you know, we've certainly had other TV writers, you know, Joe Kelly and, and that sort of thing on here. Writing for comics, do you find that more difficult? Because you guys are basically storyboarding at the same time as you're, as you're scripting right. pages. Well, something, you know, and Mark said this, I think, the last time. There is such a shortcut between the creator and the newsstand. Like, it goes through, you know... I often say if if you go to the movies or you go to a TV show, you see a TV show and it's good, like do you realize the stars it had to align in order for that to be good? Because it goes through 50 levels and everybody had to do their job perfectly from casting to this to that, you know, for it to be good. And how many writers look at what they've written up on the screen and go, I don't even recognize that. What the hell? Mark and I sit down to write and sure each each medium has its own challenges but we write it rosie draws it brad colors it troy puts it and then you read it it's like done and that's super super cool and super liberating i don't know a lot of other mediums that you get it's that direct yeah i mean it is it is kind of remarkable that there is no filter you know, most of the time for better, occasionally for worse, but there's no filter between you and the audience. And there is no other mass form of communication with the exception of novel writing in which there are so few people between you and the intended reader. And it's kind of remarkable. I mean, from a craft perspective, comics is the hardest thing in the world to write (laughs) because, you know, you're not just writing dialogue, you're not just writing story, but you're also breaking it down. You're also deciding what panels are which and how many panels are on a page and how many balloons in a panel and how many words in a balloon and you're doing math and architecture and cinematography all at once while being a dramaturge in a way like it's this weird bastard form of writing that's harder than hell the first couple of times you do it um but then after a while, it just it becomes second age. You start thinking in panels. You start thinking in splash pages. And you start, you know, your brain begins to formulate stuff in that, in that format. And, you know, then swinging back into, like, television. It's like, oh, that's right. This doesn't have to be panel one. Okay. I gotta, they can just talk for a while. Awesome. The guy can just, like, cross a room. 
Wow, all right, we don't have to do panel one. He reaches for the door. Panel two, his hand turns the doorknob. Panel three, he walks to the door. Like it's, th- there's a lot similar, but there's a bunch different between the two. I've also found that after doing comics for a while and then going back and writing scripted, it it makes you a better storyteller and a more concise storyteller because from doing comics, you, you've gotten a better sense of these are the exact moments that I need to tell this story. And it's, I know I can't speak for Mark for me, it's made me a much more economical writer because now when I'm writing, I, I, I've seen that would be three pages before is now one page and it moves at a better pace and it's, you know, all killer, no filler. So we'll, yeah. ne- we'll, we'll never get a bottle episode of genius. You know, it, it's, <laughs> I think bottle episodes are one of those things that you do when you're on like, I've been writing Spider-Man for eight years. You know what I want to not do? Tell another 18 episode story. Like you just want to do one palate cleanser. You know, I feel like for us, for if we're going to do five issue arcs, they're all bursts. They're all like headlong races for the finish that we're not going to take, you know, the, the, the odd little languorous detour and spend time with this character we've never seen before. We've never done before. I'd like to, you know, I'd like to be able to just like kind of ease off the gas once or twice and just tell a self-contained story. But in the in the current miniseries slash, you know, collected edition format, I don't uh, I mean, personally, I just kind of want to I, I want the most condensed, concentrated version of genius you can get. You could always do uh, if you do a hardcover collection, you could always do like a 10 page backup for the deluxe, you know, for the as an exclusive. <laughs> Yeah, shopping with genius. Just hey, what's Destiny doing? Ah, oh, she's going to the store. Destiny goes camping. <laughs> so if Destiny goes, you know, Destiny finds a finds a tiki on the Hawaiian beach. <laughs> oh, Is that also the uh, short where she jumps the shark yeah. <laughs> on the yes. on the water screen? <laughs> You know, people yes. sh- people shit on Star Trek Five, but I really love the Yosemite sequences. Like, call me, you know, call me crazy. And there's other yeah. things wrong with Star Trek Five. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I love the I love the bookends in Yosemite. <laughs> party of one, party of one. Yeah, I don't, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Might be alone on that one, but you know. Hey man, you know we got our nurse. Also, two two quick things. It's been killing me the whole episode. John Rambo's in Burma. In, oh, okay. it's the civil war in Burma, right? And they're yeah. trying to bring like, uh, okay. Christianity, and he's like, "You bring weapons? No, you ain't changing shit." Um, <laughs> Fuck the world. Yeah, yeah. So, that movie. Oh my god. I saw um, that on a date. Not my. Not. Not my idea. The date's idea. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing like seeing Rambo on a fifty cal on a date. Um, <laughs> we did it for like three years. That's good. Um, so you earned some currency. I did. Or was this at the beginning? Yeah. yeah was this this was the at the end? This was, was the beginning. This, this is year beginning. three. Yeah. Um, this was not. Yeah, because the... I took I took a first date to see Fletch two, and there was no <laughs> second date. Chevy <laughs> Chase didn't yeah, do it for anybody. Fletch two. <laughs> the fletchening. Yeah. yeah. There's a Fletch. Two, there's a Fletch two, but there was never a dread two. Um, yeah, Fletch harder. Yeah. Fletch harder. Um, no, I wanted to also talk about because there's a movie coming out in February, and and Mark, you spoke on it beautifully did like a reaction i think to one of the trailers once and i was curious adam to hear your thoughts because we have black panther coming out and out of all of like the big like comic movies or big star Wars related things coming out this year that i could think of black panther is the one i'm looking forward to most not han solo not han solo <laughs> um yeah not even young chewbacca can save that one um but who knows maybe but anyway, no, I was curious, just, you know, uh, you know, as it gets closer, you know, your thoughts towards, you know, the next big Marvel movie and the fact that, you know, it's, it's you know, I love Ryan Coogler, you know, everyone involved. And I think it's, it's really seems to be geared up to be something kind of really big and, and, and wonderful. I'm, I'm so excited for Black Panther. And, and I think all the, the social and, and racial and you know reasons to be incredibly excited about it aside it just looks like an amazing movie and i'm excited for something new and mm-hmm. and you know mark has talked a lot about how um the marvel universe is like episodes of a tv show you know and they've they've been very smart to realize that 
superhero is not a genre. They can do the political thriller. They can do the, you know, and this is a world that we haven't seen before. So I'm super excited about that. I'm super, you know, I, I'll be happy if I don't go back to Asgard again. I'm cool with it. This is a, a, a world that we haven't seen before. It's characters we haven't seen before. It's characters with motivations and a culture we haven't seen before. The action looks great. The actors are amazing. The director is amazing. You know, I'm, 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 I'm almost worried that I'm hyping myself up for it too much, you know, <laughs> but there was all this, there was, you know, the, the Black Panther toy commercial came out and there was a lot of talk online just from a, from a, you know, racial perspective, why that commercial was so important and why it was so important for young African-American kids to see that and want those toys. And I'm a fat white Jew from Long Island. And I was like, I want those toys. That looks freaking <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And I'm just excited for it to be a good movie. I think it's going to register on a lot of levels. I'm not going to lie and say it's going to hit me on the same gut level that it's going to hit some other people. But um, I'm super excited for it. I'm proud for what it represents. And it just looks like a good movie. Yeah. And uh, I think I think it was just announced this morning that it broke uh, the MCU's record for pre-sale tickets in a 24-hour yeah. period. Uh, Broke so, Civil War, I think. Yeah, so so it looks like it looks like uh, at least I think the country. I don't know if this is a worldwide tally, but at least you know the country is just as excited as you are, and I, and it's so so much. I think I speak for the the rest of us that we're you know really excited for it too here at Geek Out. Well, the fact that the world is excited for it shows that it's a little ray of hope. That's like it's it's as it should be. Like you know, I can't I can't speak to it like Mark can, but. I, I'm I'm excited that people are excited about it and I'm excited for the I'm excited for the people that it means something for and I'm excited for the people that it doesn't mean anything for because that's what it should be. It there shouldn't be a big deal because there is a you know African American lead superhero. I mean, it's a shame that that has to be an achievement. I, I'm looking forward to the world where it just it's not even mentioned because it's not an issue. Yeah, it's funny. Like I was talking about it uh, to somebody yesterday, and uh, we were just in, a, despite whatever else you might think, however, whatever you know, levels of importance one impl- imparts to this to this movie from a social perspective, from a racial perspective, the level of talent involved is frankly ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Like, you know, Forrest Whitaker is playing like he's got an Oscar, like Best Actor Oscar. And he's playing like a fifth lead. Like, he's not even the star of this movie. You know, Lupita's got an Oscar. She's not even the star of this movie. There's like the depth of this talent. The the bench on this movie is astonishing. Like, this would if this was any movie with any cast that was this friggin' amazing, you know, you'd go anyway. Right. And, and just the fact that it also happens to be for a fucking superhero movie is doubly ridiculous. And I'm I'm all for it. Uh, th- you know, that leads me to our really our, our signature trademark question. <laughs> what are you guys currently geeking out over? <laughs> uh, I, I am I am one episode shy of finishing Runaways, which I which I like quite a bit on on the Hulus from the Marvels. Um, I am I'm making my way through Black Mirror, which is frightening and astonishing and um, I'm fearful for the rest of humanity, uh, in the best way. Of course. <laughs> um, what else am I geeking out over? Um, reruns of Parks and Rec, because I can, it turns out I can watch that show all day, every day, and, uh, and never get bored of it. Yeah, it's hard. There's so much out there. I mean, Black, Black Mirror, to me, you know, as a, as a seller, of 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 content who's always in the room, you know, pitching to these networks. Black Mirror to me is like blows my mind that someone was sat in a room, was pitched a story about having sex with a pig on television, mm-hmm. and they went, "Yeah," <laughs> like that blows blows my mind and gives me hope. 
you know. Not just um, yeah, but yeah, that'll be our first episode. Yeah. That's going to be the I mean, one that think, sets the pace. You think about it. It's very easy to sit back and go, that's a great episode. But like I said before, with the layers, someone had to green light that. Someone had to tell their boss they green lit it. Somebody had like the layers to that all these people were like, yes, go for that. That gives me like a little ray of hope in this industry where everything is supposed to be a, a sequel or recognizable or a piece of IP or whatever it may be. The fact that they continue go – well, now they have enough currency because everybody knows it's great. But for the first episode in the pitch, to pitch that idea and have, and have it go, that, that's amazing. You know, on the, on the non-comic book genre geek out, um, like Mark been watching Parks and Rec, I, I spent, I think, seven hours the other night watching now that Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee is on Netflix. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I could just, I could just, I'm a, I'm a huge stand up uh, nerd and just watch, I can sit and watch comedians talk about the craft of stand up comedy and joke and kibitz and have coffee forever. It's like, the, I want to be a fly on the wall, on, you know, in that room. I want to be in the room where that happens. <laughs> yeah, it's an amazing show. As, as old New Yorkers, do you guys have a, you know, uh, have any stories of like the comedy seller or do you have any favorite stand-ups that you know kennison or anybody you might have seen um i got roped into taking this girl to her prom and we ended up at i think it was catch a rising star and it was the first time i ever heard or saw of carrot top and <laughs> you know he's one of those guys that like now oh, prop comedian and this and that and he's what, you know, whatever he's done to his body, he's a super great guy. I've worked with him since, but, but seeing Carrot Top for the first time, walking into that show, not knowing who he is, what his shtick is, what anything, it, it actually blew my mind. It's very easy to look back now and be like, oh, it's this, he doesn't get, you know, you shouldn't respect him because of A, B, and C, but, but he is a vastly underrated quick wit he's gotten he, his pace is different now and i know it's not a sexy answer to say like i was there when kinnison did coke off some chick's tits in the front row of the whatever but but seeing carrot top for the first time going in not knowing who the hell this skinny skinny scrawny wendy's looking guy was was pretty awesome <laughs> yeah i think i went to go see um must have been like 10 years ago 12 years ago um one of the people whose names we're not supposed to mention again in public, but uh, Louis C.K., uh, I saw him at Caroline's, and he was fine. But Hannibal Burris opened for Louis C.K., and I had never seen Hannibal Burris before, and I'd never seen a comedian just, like, lean back into a set quite the way that Hannibal does. Like, there's... It's all joke, it's all written, but it, it felt so like extemporaneous it felt so much like you you just stumble into a corner of this dude's brain and he's slowly peeling the onion of it and you're getting to see it um like i'd never heard his name before but since i've become an ardent devotee but yeah like that's just one of those things that happens in new york where some comedians like hey you're funny why don't you come and open for me okay who's that eh, he's a writer on on you know late night and sure he might have done he, he was a writer on on 30 rock but yeah we think he can do stand up so let's let him do stand up and he'll kill it well one one of the great things about Hannibal and his delivery is you know the the one of the secrets to being a great stand up is you're you're telling these jokes or these stories that you've crafted down to like the comma and the pause but you need to sound like it's the first time you're ever saying it and with a lot of Hannibal's stuff, especially his early stuff, you know, the guy has worked really, really hard. But if you told me that he had didn't have a clue what he was going to say and he just went up there and spoke, I would believe that, too, because of everything that Mark said. He's so just like he's so comfortable and leans back. You don't feel like this is something that he labored over. You feel like it's just a really funny guy giving giving amazing insight. And the other thing I used to do in New York all the time when I would go to open mic nights because I have an equal fascination with with horrible comics bombing. Oh, sure. Oh, man. And, it's the schadenfreude. <laughs> that it could I'm telling you, there could be there, you know, like one of one of um, uh, like Patton Oswalt talk has a great story about the 
going to an open mic, hosting an open mic night and the heroin addict like fell asleep at the mic. Like <laughs> it, it, it's, there's so much to be learned and gleaned from people that bomb. And sometimes they are some of the most surreal experiences. It could be like equally as fun. The, uh, I feel like every time I'm either at the stand on the Lower East Side or in the cellar, like the two guys that are always there are Hannibal Burris and Jim Norton. Like I'm guaranteed to yes. run into one or yeah. both of those people. Yeah, I think the the time that uh, when I back when I was living in New York and you visited and we went to the cellar, both of them were on the the bill, and that was right before Hannibal Burris blew up big with the uh, the Bill Cosby thing. Yeah. So I was and like the Eric oh, Andre. Show. Yeah, yeah. Well, yes, uh, <laughs> yeah, yes. He did. He did something that was also in his wheelhouse. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, like. Um, I was like, I've heard of this guy before because, you know, yeah, he was a writer. And, and I think I had seen like a Comedy Central special where he was just one of 20. Like a premium blend. Yeah, something like that. And like, I was like, this guy is hilarious. <laughs> and then, yeah, like a year later, he's like doing, you know, movies and stuff like that. Now he's in Spider Man. Yeah. <laughs> have you guys heard, um, have you guys heard Chad Daniels? No, no. no. I want to give, I want to give, chad daniels a, a shout out because he's he i love you know we all like being able to say oh we were on the ground floor or whatever but i equally love when you discover something late and you have a great like back catalog to go to like if you're just discovering black mirror now you can sit and binge all this stuff and it's new to you so i just stumbled upon chad daniels i'd never heard of him before but he's got four albums out and um they're all amazing he's just so funny and i i couldn't believe i hadn't heard of this guy before so definitely check out chad daniels if you can yeah we'll do you know before we let you guys back loose in the the wilds of los angeles uh i remember the last time we had kind of danced around these questions and here we are we we're now officially in awards season what was your favorite movie and it doesn't have to be an awards movie they can't all be like ladybird but like what's your <laughs> favorite what was your favorite movie of 2017 and on the flip side of that coin what was your least favorite movie of 2017 uh well i i I have some of this sort of in the front of my mind because we did a a top 10 list on uh, fat man on batman like last week i think or the week before the end of the year and uh so my top three were logan uh get out and shape of water um all of which, you know, are are different movies to be certain. Mm-hmm. Um, one of which is sort of the 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 last ride of a Western hero. Um, you know, one of them is a, an incredibly incisive look at at race in America, and while also being a crackerjack thriller. And then the other is this just hauntingly evocative, incredibly beautiful romance between. Um, a monster and the woman who loves him and e- each of them, you know, operated at a different speed at a different frequency, but all of them are, are sort of the Zenith of their craft for me anyway. Um, I got to think I'm woefully unprepared for this question. I, <laughs> I, uh, I, I loved Logan. Um, I also really liked, um, Coco. Mm. Um, I'm continually amazed by them for pure fun. I don't think I had more fun in a movie this year than, than Ragnarok. Mm. However popular or unpopular that is. I, that was a lot, I hadn't sat in a movie and just looked around going, can you, can you believe we're watching this right now? Like this is fucking <laughs> awesome. I hadn't had that happen in a long, long time where it was just pure fun. Yeah, I laughed a lot during that movie. Yeah. Like, just it was. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Am I the only Blade Runner two advocate in the? I got you. It's okay. Yeah. It, it wasn't up there on the top for me. I think you know. I think Blade Runner. You know when the, I remember when the the prequels came out, and Mark and I and our friends went to see them, and after the initial wave of, oh my God, Star Wars is back. Uh, after the initial wave washed over us and we had a little perspective and not, n- none of us wanted to be the first one to say, is it me or was that not that good? <laughs> um, w- when we started getting more into the criticisms of it, we were talking about how like he, Lucas obviously fell in love, a little too much in love with his own world. You know, um, I, I, we don't, no one cares about midichlorians. Nobody cares, you know, like 
And I, I felt watching Blade Runner um, that, you know, it was this, this, the same the same stuff that, uh, uh, you know, plagued a little bit of Superman Returns, although I like that movie. Um, I felt like Blade Runner was a little too like, oh, my God, I'm making a Blade Runner movie, <laughs> um, you know, but I liked it. I just didn't love it. Yeah. Yeah. I, like it is probably that and Shape of Water are the two most beautiful movies I've seen this year. Yeah, it was beautiful. It's beautiful, but it's it's remote for me. Like it's it's an object of art more than it is, you know, an experience that 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 I invested in. Mm-hmm. Um, which is just to say, like they didn't make that movie for me. They made the best movie that they wanted to make, and it just seems to be a movie that I didn't respond to. Um, I'm having a little bit of, of of a hard time with the worst movie I saw. Um, uh, because now that I now that I'm not a journalist anymore, I don't have to go see movies. Um, so I'm not confronted with, oh God, I had to go sit through that. Um, I will say that and when I at this point, when I come across movies that I don't like, it's because there was the capacity for success. There was the potential for quality that had just been at some point cast aside and 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 like Adam said, the 1,800 people who have to sign off on a $200 million movie almost automatically renders that it becomes something kind of bland and boring and uninspired. Um, I think there probably was a decent Justice League movie to be made, but there had been so many bad decisions made leading up to Justice League that I don't know how you pull that particular bacon out of that fire. (laughs) Um, I was not a fan of Bright. Mm, Um, Yeah. The David Ayer, Max Landis, Will Smith, uh, Training Day with Orcs, Jammy Jam on Netflix. Yeah. Um, you know, just because it was, it to me, it felt lazy. It felt like we just want to do Training Day with Orcs. We don't actually want to build a world in which Orcs had been a slave class and what that, what the ramifications of that are like to modern day America. We just wanted to have Orc gangs. Okay, sure. Yeah, I guess. Uh, okay. All right. Maybe. Um, so I, think, just, I think also, Mark. I think what we. I don't want to speak for you, but from from what you said about it in the past, it's kind of like longing for what Bright could have been. Yeah. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. You it's know? like you know, there, there's not. It's a decent idea. Like there's 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 a kernel of something really fun there, but you have to do the work. You have to to be rigorous about it about building that world and building the social structures and understanding how characters would intertwine in this world. Not just here's a dude with an ancient sword at the corners of Figueroa and main street in downtown LA. It's like, yeah, yeah, I mean, sure, I guess, but guys, you spent $90 million on a movie that should have been way better than it was. Um, but it's a hit and they're making another one. So who am I to say without Max Landis, <laughs> what do we know? you know what? Another movie I think doesn't get, a uh... I don't know. It hasn't been talked about as much because it was earlier in the year. But I absolutely loved um, War for the Planet of the Apes. I love that whole uh, that whole franchise, whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. I think I think um, Caesar is one of the the greatest characters on film in the last five or six years. Um, I just I love that film, and those are three films that I that I watch all the time. I feel like that third one kind of came and went. Like I don't, I don't remember it being in the cinemas that long. I don't know if no. it was like overshadowed by. It was kind of bookended by Wonder Woman and Dunkirk, and I mean, yeah, I mean Andy Serkis goes for always goes for broke, and and then the cinematography in that one in particular is gorgeous, and you get Woody Harrelson basically as Colonel Kurtz, but with what? but with gorillas, <laughs> um, or I guess well no, he's got like a gorilla yeah. on his side, mm-hmm. yeah. But uh, yeah, that that was a movie that yeah, you're right, Adam. It was kind of not on a lot of people's radar this year. Yeah, I don't remember how it did. Like I remember they pushed it pretty hard, and I remember the reviews were really strong. Yeah, but you know, it did that thing where it was one of you know sixteen giant releases in July, and and some things will fall by the wayside as they always do, and I think that was a casualty of of schedule more than anything else. Oh, and you, and Valerian was pretty bad. I know everybody shits on that. 
that was <laughs> yeah, I did not I did not finish that movie. <laughs> I didn't I didn't I didn't see it in the in the theater. Yeah. Here, here, here's when you know a movie is bad, okay? Because I think you talked. I think the last time you asked us was ever a movie you walked out of. You guys actually stuck around for Wing Commander. I remember. Yeah. Well, that was yeah. That was just because of the yeah. But but a a a more apt question is not what movie theater did you walk out of? Did you ever see a movie that almost made you walk out of your own house? <laughs> <laughs> like I came. I was I was more leaning towards leaving my house than turning the TV off because I just wanted to get far away from it. I I I saw Valerian in theaters and I, I I the entire time I was like, this is very pretty, but I wish I was back home watching the fifth element. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, the closest I got to walking out of a theater this past year was watching The Founder with Michael Keaton. Oh. Um and some people really dug that movie. Some people really dig Roy Kroc. And, you know, I, I'm a Ke- I've been a Keaton fan since, like, well, I was too young for Clean and Sober, but I guess, like, Batman 89. <laughs> that would have gone over your head, too, young Sam. Yeah, yeah. It's like, why does he have a mullet? Uh, <laughs> everybody had a mullet in the 80s. It's cool. We're, we're fine. Uh, Uncle Jesse had a mullet. The, um, uh, but, no, like, there was just moments. W- I, w- what is it about the founder that just killed us? Because we all saw it together. Uh, it's I don't like remember. the curse of the geek out boys seeing a movie together. We all hate it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I I I recently like cause I Adam was the same. Like I felt that I really dropped the ball going to see movies this year. Like Blade Runner yeah. twenty Blade Runner twenty forty nine was my own damn fault because I didn't see it in theaters, and so it was available on uh, you know Vudu or whatever digital. I bought it and I played a game with myself where I was like. How long to this movie am I going to regret not seeing it in theaters? And the opening shot was like the, you know, Ryan Gosling's car, like, car. over top of this like beautiful landscape in the synth. And I was like, oh, already. Fuck. <laughs> and so like for the rest of the movie, I was just pissed at myself for not seeing it in theaters. Um, well, there's some of those movies. And I think Valerian falls into that. Too, sure. Where you're like, wow, this would make a great director's reel. Yeah. I don't know what the story is. No. But this would make, <laughs> a, you know, like. Kong's this will get out. him another job, yeah. you know. Um, I, w- I would not put it on the actor's reel. Uh, no. But the director's reel, the cinematographer's reel, special yeah. effects artist's reel, for sure. There was some really, like, I get Rihanna's reel, maybe. She yeah. did a fine job. At yeah. Um, no, but I saw uh, girl gone bad. three, <laughs> over the past three weeks, I saw The Shape of Water, Lady Bird, and I, Tanya. And those were three movies that I thought were, like, remarkably good. Like, everybody... Like, you know, especially The Shape of Water, because we've always, for some reason, followed everything Doug Jones has ever done on this podcast. Batman Returns. Yeah, <laughs> Batman Returns. And I just, I love um, acting behind a mask and heavy makeup. And I feel like, like you were saying too, uh, you know, Adam, with like, you know, Andy Serkis and Caesar, like, you want to get like the most pure acting possible. Don't let yeah. them use their face and their eyes, you know, or I mean, you know, or, or hinder them in some kind of way. And right. Doug Jones, just the little movements that he does in The Shape of Water, like I was, I loved all of that so much, and it was so beautiful. But also, some you know, horrifying moments here and there, you know, because that's 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 Michael th- Shannon. Yeah, well, Michael Shannon was astounding in that movie. Like I said, everyone, like, everyone in those three movies that I saw did astoundingly well, like with their performances. And and Michael Shannon's one of those guys. It might be my favorite performance he's ever done. Um, but he's those, good in in everything he does. Well, he's he's got just that intensity, you know. Just, yeah, just yeah. that that. He's pissed all the time, <laughs> um, but he's, yeah, he's, he does he's an amazing yeah. Iggy Pop. In case you haven't seen that, I haven't. No, there's there's that. video footage of him on stage at a bar in L.A. covering "Lust for Life." Oh wow! In a uh, no shirt on, wearing leather pants, channeling the best <laughs> fucking Iggy Pop you've ever seen. That's amazing. I have to yes. I have to check that out. <laughs> but uh, yeah, before we, I, I, you know, I guess well, I already did the wilds of los angeles line but the yeah any, anything you guys want to plug before we before we uh, let you guys go um i mean i think you know for 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 me the big thing is genius cartel volume two you know it's it's we we love this character we love getting to tell these stories and the more people who check it out the more we'll get to do that for longer yeah gene genius two and i don't know how much the audiences overlap on this particular podcast but I'm the EP of Mama June's reality show, and that and that debuts Friday. So, any 
geeks that for some remote reason have a perverse interest in Mama June, that's Friday. Is that on <laughs> what what channel is that on? That is on We TV. Women's Television Network, which probably has even a bigger overlap with this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I always mean, surprised. I'm I mean, I surprised. was I was the uh, I worked uh, as a post PA for Cindy Lauper's reality show on Wee TV. So, who knows? There oh, might nice. be an overlap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it always surprises me who listens to this show. Like the fact that we get the numbers that we do, and the from the places that we do. I'm always like, well, we're just three. We very nearly entitled this show. Three idiots, one microphone. Back when our like when we were first starting out, back when yeah, we only no had headphones one microphone. and yeah. one microphone. <laughs> yeah, it was like a Beatles thing, except we weren't like singing, <laughs> changing music forever. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'm always kind of surprised by our audience. But you know, th- thanks again for coming on the show again. The uh, the second volume of Genius Genius Cartel comes out in comic book stores and on Comicsology everywhere on Wednesday, February 21st. Adam, Mark, thanks again for coming on. Of Thank course, you so much, guys. Time. Really appreciate it. Always, always a good time having those having those two on. Oh, absolutely! You know, For talking, sure. yeah, talking the New York comedy scene, and and of course their their book out again on February twenty first in mm-hmm. comic book stores everywhere. Um, yeah, you guys getting anything in the uh, in the interim? I watched the first episode of Altered Carbon mm. uh, this this week. Looks very Blade Runner. Yes, uh, it's it's uh, it's very it's very. Um, I would I would say that it's that it's visual feel. It, the motif, if you will, uh, is very inspired by Blade Runner's universe. Cyberpunk. Yeah, it's a, and it's a good it's a good look to go with because it's very it, it, instantly. I was like, ah, yes, the future. <laughs> 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 and then uh, there's also like a sprinkling of like Demolition Man in it because the main character, uh, RoboCop from the RoboCop remake, or Joel Kinnaman, or whatever he whatever his name was in the Killers or the Killing, the Killing, Killing, yeah. I, I'm drawing a blank, or something. terrible, because Corey um, would kill me. Lyndon um, is, is uh, Muriel Enos, which makes yo him... Yo, Lyndon. Lyndon and... Yo, Lyndon. Yo, Lyndon. Eat <laughs> your Funyuns. Kick Funyuns, yo. Funyuns. Lyndon, Funyuns, yo. Funyuns. Funyuns. Corey, call in and <laughs> let us know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so he uh, he plays he plays the main character, uh, which is cool because this is like one of the first things since The Killing that I've liked him in, that I've Ooh. seen him in. Because uh, I didn't really like RoboCop, but um, you didn't love Suicide Squad. I didn't like him in Suicide Squad. Uh-huh. I don't uh, think he likes him in Suicide woo! Squad. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, it's 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 really good. Uh, it has, like I said, it has, has a Holden. sprinkling of of yeah, Holden. a sprinkling of Demolition Man because uh, like the the body, the 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 Kinnaman's body, uh, is just like uh, it's like freeze dried in a in a in a freezer. Uh, and then uh, when the character needs to be woken up because he's a prisoner, uh, his consciousness is put into Kinnaman's body uh, and uh, woken up and uh, has to solve a crime, much like Sylvester Stallone in Demolition Man. Um, but uh, So I'm only in one episode in, so I don't really know much about the overall story, but it is a very cool visual. I like, I'm like. i liking what I'm seeing, and I uh, can't wait to have time to watch the rest of the episodes because... Uh, it was it's a Netflix series, so it's probably got at least ten episodes, right? Um, so looking, yeah, somewhere around there in that ballpark. Yeah. Um, hopefully not like thirteen, where they have a shit ton of filler episodes. But, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. So that was that was that was a fun watch so far. Uh, and then I also uh staying on Netflix. Um, after the Super Bowl, I watched the the uh, Cloverfield Paradox. Which I hear a lot of people giving it flack, uh, and I personally I blame that a lot on the one trailer that we were given for it uh, that kind of promised, not even kind of, like it straight up promised that it was going to answer a lot of the questions within the Cloverfield universe, and it literally answers none of them. Personally, I don't have a problem with that because I like it being kind of vague. I don't need to know where the monsters came from or why they're here. Cloverfield 2 doesn't answer anything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and se- and also Cloverfield 2, or more specifically 10 Cloverfield Lane, if you want to be. That's the name. I could remember <laughs> it for the longest time. Uh, it sets up the fact that they're all supposed to be separate stories, you know, loosely connected with this idea of like monsters attacking the planet. 
but you know for uh, for uh, the 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 overall story of paradox doesn't even take place on on earth and doesn't involve monsters um but it it the movie itself is very cool very uh reminiscent of movies like uh of uh, uh, um the the hell one with dr e uh, uh, alan grant from jurassic park event horizon um it like it had a it had a kind of a event horizon feel to it which i guess also means that it has kind of a dead space kind of feel to it because mm. if i remember correctly dead space had uh, had a similar feel yes uh <laughs> thank you um because the 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 overall or the 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 plot the main plot or the reason why these people are in space they have a space station where they have desi- built the uh the world quote unquote world i guess the solar system's largest uh particle accelerator much like the the hadron collider but it's oh that's right cuz the movie was originally called god particle yes um and uh so they they're in space so that they can do it without destroying the universe i guess um or at least destroying the planet uh and uh, they they spend like 2 years trying to 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 work it trying to make it uh work finally it does and they get zapped out of our universe when uh when it kicks on uh and so the, the story is about them trying to get back to our uh, or i guess their proper universe who knows what universe it is um but like things start going wonky on the ship and to my nerd brain i'm like oh much like how like you know certain time travel stories you know posit that time tries to fix itself uh just like that the the stephen king jfk book um the date of whatever Kennedy's yeah 11 26 69 or whatever three. 62 three yeah. I don't know. Ask ask James Franco. Uh, he made Nobody the wants to talk to him. <laughs> he made the miniseries that's available on uh, Amazon Prime. Uh, Hulu? Is it Hulu? Hulu? Oh, it is Hulu. Ah, well, whatever. I'm not getting paid for this. <laughs> None of us are. Yeah. Uh, if anything, we're losing money doing this. Uh, <laughs> uh, the collective we. <laughs> <laughs> the royal. The royal. This the Sam Stone we. Uh, but, uh, but so much like that, uh, you know, the, 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 and, and others that it's not nearly the only one that pauses. It's but this universe is like fighting back against them. Cause it's like, Hey, you're not supposed to be here. So like weird shit starts to happen. Um, Chris O'Dowd, one of my favorite, uh, Irish actors is in it. Uh, and he, his, not Pierce. huh? Not Pierce? No, I said one of <laughs> <laughs> Liam Neeson's is also an Irish actor. Um, technically Seamus from the WWE is an Irish actor because he was in the Turtles movie. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, his hand like goes through a wall and then he pulls his arm back and he now has a stump and he's not in pain. He's not bleeding or anything. It's like he was born without an arm. Um, uh, and then later they find his arm crawling around the ship. Uh, and it's like sentient. Uh, but, uh, Oh, evil dead too. Or idle hands. Yeah. Um, or that hand floating in dead space. I don't know if it was sentient. I've never played the game, but I know that that's the cover. Uh, <laughs> but yes, much or or the Adams family. Uh, <laughs> except I guess that hand wasn't lopped off from any. Well, I, I don't we know don't, the backstory. We, we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I th- I enjoyed the movie. Uh, it made me really want to watch Event Horizon, which I still haven't done since watching it. And, and like I'm still itching to do it. Uh, but it itself, as a standalone story, if you f- forget that it was marketed as answering all the questions from the previous Cloverfield movies and just take it for what it is, you know, an episode of The Twilight Zone, uh, which is what Cloverfield, the series, is being marketed as, you know, an anthology movie series. If you just sit there and, you know, put the blinders on to the other two movies, I think it's a great sci-fi like kind of like claustrophobic thriller movie um which you know if you want to get into spoiler territory cover your ears uh if you don't want to hear this but like yeah by the end of it they get back to their proper universe and they jump down to earth you know gravity style and then boom there's a giant monster and then cut to credits cool that's how it ties in with the rest of the series it doesn't need it (laughs) Because I think it was fine without it, but that one scene does not ruin the rest of the movie, which is a, what a lot of people seemed to, you know, be bitching about. 
much like how I think 10 Cloverfield Lane could have ended five or ten minutes before it actually did, I it didn't need that monster at the end. But otherwise, 98% a fine film. Sam, did you get into anything this week? Uh, no, <laughs> no, uh, not really. Um, watch the Super Bowl. Uh, 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 um, got two PlayStation Four games, which, but my PlayStation Four itself is still in the box. Uh-huh. Uh, 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 the two games being Uncharted Four: Thieves' End and Batman: Arkham Knight. Mm. But again, PS Four still in the box, <laughs> so <laughs> they're just there. Uh, I do hear those are some quality games. I do too. I mean, that's why. Yeah, I mean, that's why. <laughs> got them. I just need to, you know, actually get off my ass <laughs> and uh, ass. <laughs> and uh, hook up my uh, my PlayStation and and you know play on it. Mm. Live up to the first to its to its prefix. Um, yeah. No, I that that was really it was kind of a whirlwind of a week, but like whirlwind of work. Um, and I feel like this coming week's kind of going to be the same thing. There's Valentine's Day, guys. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll I'll order the heart shaped pizza from Pizza Hut and eat it by myself. They have heart shaped pizzas. At they pizza do. Hut? They've been doing that for a couple of years. I've been doing Valentine's Day wrong for years. Or you could go to Hooters and you get like free wings if you bring like a picture of an ex or something like that. Look, don't don't take my word for it. Look up what the deal is, but it's something like. Free wings for single people. Jesus. Damn. <laughs> you said it, man. Yeah. Nobody fucks with Jesus. Um, <laughs> I don't know where I was going with that. Uh, the uh, Yeah. So, again, Genius, Volume 2, Cartel, out in comic book stores everywhere on Wednesday, February 21st. Thanks again to Mark and Adam for coming on the show. Always a good time hanging Absolutely. out with those two. Yep. Um, yeah. This has been another installment of Catching Up, guys. I'm Sam. I'm Chris. I'm Jake. Thank you very much. Good night, Eric Bonner. This has been another Geek Out production. If you enjoyed what you heard, hey, you know, we've got a special episode every Friday. Of course, there's the usual catching up show every Wednesday. And you get book club episodes just about every Tuesday these days. Thanks for listening.